Well, it's good morning, everyone. Shelley and I are happy, delighted, in fact, to fit in with your uh, theme for this month of testimony. And um, in the time that, that we've got left, we're we supposed to finish, I think, at half past. Is that correct? Please. Yeah. Yep. Um, <laughs> well, because Shirley and I are getting on in life, we recognise that if we get up and just talk off the cuff, we talk too much. And so we've had written out this testimony this morning so that I can tell you it takes 25 minutes. So we'll be a few minutes over, if that's okay. By way of introduction then, here are three foundational truths for every believer. This is necessary foundational truths um, that I've only recently discovered. One, Ephesians 1, 3 to 5, and I'd like to read that to you. If it's a discovery that you haven't yet taken on board, consider it. Even before he made the world, God loved us. How is that possible? And chose us. How is that possible? To be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do. And it gave him great pleasure. Consider that verse and all that that means and entails. I put with that a second verse where Paul says, but even before I was born, say that to yourself, put I in there, even before I was born, God chose me and called me by his marvellous grace. That's every one of us here this morning. I want to put beside that a sentence from Steps to Christ, an amazing statement, and it says, the sinner, that's us, may resist this love, may refuse to be drawn, but if he does not resist, he will be drawn to Jesus. How about that? From that I get these thoughts, which are the foundations for our, what we have to say this morning. Nothing happens by chance. Amen. When we say good luck, don't bother saying that anymore. Nothing happens by chance. Everything happens according to God's plan if you are a believer. And God's priority is your salvation. Today, right now, God is lining up the events in your life. For your future belief and work and answered prayer. We could have that little image if possible. I've, if there was a title to my talk this morning, it would be that, without words. Just like we like to get our lives in order and line, get our ducks in order, I believe that God is lining stuff up for you as he has for us. Right now, as you sit here and you don't know anything about it. God's getting his ducks in a row. I saw the snow this morning when I was driving down Linwood Avenue on the mountains and I had read this morning about how much snow fell it's less than five millimetres I wonder if our five millimetres of faith has as much impact as that five millimetres of snow all over the mountains does because everybody can see it and I hope that our faith um, is like that and everybody can see it. Um, we're going to tell a story of our lives. I was born in 1945 in Brisbane, in Australia. I was number six child in the family. Is there any kids here that are number six in their family? I don't think so. Yes, they've got to be uh, one the family. The family, oh, there's one, yep. eventually became eight. My dad had recently got a job in the Seventh-day Adventist firm, Sanitarium Health Food Company. And when I came home in the hospital with mum, um, the roof was on the partly built house which he was trying to build and the family moved from the foul house where they had lived until there was enough house built by dad to move into. So one of the most important routines in our household was morning and evening worship. Kids, do you have morning and evening worship in your house? If you do, put your hand up. If you don't, you talk to mum and dad about it. It's a very important thing to do. It's, it takes a lot of trouble, I know, for parents to be able to keep a routine going that they don't um, run out on. 
This happened before the older ones went to bed at night. Um, in the evenings, Dad would sometimes read something from the scripture and he would pray. And in the mornings, we would study the Sabbath school lesson with mum and she would pray. And on Friday nights, Dad would read from Desire of Ages or the Great Controversy or the Bible. And this gave us a good grounding in faith and also helped us to realise what was the most important things in life. On Friday nights, we always said the Lord's Prayer for our prayer and that's how I learned the Lord's Prayer. Put your hand up if you know the Lord's Prayer. Most people do, but it's a good way, uh, parents, to teach children to use the Lord's Prayer as your prayer one, one day a week. When I was almost four, Dad's work took him to Hobart in Tasmania. Now, Brisbane's a warm place, always warm, but Hobart's cold. It's, uh, it's colder than Christchurch a lot of the time. It's like in Chicago. Um, I did all my schooling in Launceston. Um, primary school, there was less than 20 kids in the school. Such a tiny little school, we couldn't even play cricket or learn any of the team games. Um, and at high school, I suddenly went to school with more than a thousand kids and I was in a class of 40 girls. Um, it was a big shock. I can remember the first day wandering around this huge expanse of place trying to know where I should be and what I should be doing. I was lucky to have some of the best teachers possible in primary school. One of them taught me um, when I was doing primary teaching at Avondale at, uh, and was a wonderful person. So I was lucky to have those good teachers. The headmaster at the high school was a Methodist lay preacher and quite often for assembly he would preach a sermon. And I really appreciated that because I realised that Christianity was in the public school and that was something really good. I wish that was the case today. Miss Dean, the typing teacher at our school, <coughs> got me my first job when I was 16 as a secretary in Launceston. And before the end of the year, Dad got another transfer to Newcastle and then to Tamworth, which is sort of a country town halfway between Sydney and Brisbane, inland, where it was freezing in the winter and terribly hot in the summer. I continued to work in an office, saving for my Avondale fees. Morning and evening worship still continued at home until I left home just before 18 to go to Avondale, where I enrolled to do the primary teaching course. Leon and I met at Avondale. My story from birth to when I met Shirley is a story of two monuments. One was my mother. My mother was an only child, a spoilt child. She had rheumatic fever when a baby and was not expected to live. Her mother, my grandma, was advised by the doctors that the best way was to give her what she wanted and not make a fuss. What a recipe. It was Well, my mother, if you'd known her, was a firecracker. So Gladys, my mother, was strong-minded, strong-willed, given to bursts of anger, which continued throughout her life. Because she was deaf at age eight, her normal speaking voice was loud. But when she took one of these fits, generally with my father, it was louder. But with all her faults... God used her to accomplish his main purpose for our family. Amen. And it happened this way. With a family of four boys in England, my mother rebelled, as she would, against the close living in one of those pockets that is English life. She wanted, as she called it, elbow room to live. She wanted wide open spaces not available in England. She conceived the idea of going to Australia. So in 1951, before most of you were born, at age seven, I found myself on the Asturias, a ship bound for the promised land, Australia. Officially, eight of us boarded that ship in Southampton. I well remember my grandpa's sister. The eight of us was four boys, mum and dad, and my grandma and grandpa. But my grandfather's sister came to see us off 
from Southampton, and I remember her walking up the gangplank with just her handbag. She came down to the cabins to see where we were going to live, and that's all I knew. The ship left, but to our surprise, three days later, Auntie Maud was found stowed away. And so now they were known. (laughs) Couldn't turn a ship that size around after three days at sea. And so we settled on a sugarcane farm in Queensland uh, where where we were for five years, north of Brisbane that is, Bundaberg. God gave my mother, by the way, what she wanted, wide open spaces. There were 80 acres carved out of the bush. She was a a romantic, and she loved it. Grandma, we were baptised 12... Oh, sorry, let me go back just a fraction. One day on our way to the sugar mill with a load of cane, we noticed road signs, round signs, about that big. And on those signs were written, and some of you may remember these days, dead men do tell tales. What do you reckon was going on? An evangelist had come to town. My mother, always a seeker, she tried every religion you could possibly think of and lots of others. She saw these signs and said, we're going. So she and my oldest brother went for the first two nights. And I well remember her words as she came back from the first night. Three words, this is it. Twelve months later, six of us were baptised into Jesus. Grandma and Grandpa and Auntie Maud were baptised a couple of years later. God had accomplished his purpose through my mother, imperfect though she was. In 1951, you must understand, England was post-Christian. God had led us to a country where he could accomplish his purposes for us, the hearing of the gospel and salvation through my mum. So to the second monument. It was a monumental error on the part of my dad. Or was it? Being New Adventists, we were off to our first big camp. And I remember going to that big camp, never seen anything like it. (laughs) And at 7.30 one morning, my dad set off to the meeting at the big tent. But when he got there, no one was there. He'd set the alarm by mistake by mistake, one hour early. And so he followed the sound of nearby singing and found himself in the coal porter's tent. (laughs) And within 12 months, we'd sold out, sold the cane farm, moved to Sydney where Dad moved from cane farmer to coal porter. And there he remained for the rest of his life. My oldest brother went to Avondale, became a minister. My next oldest brother went to Sydney Sanitarium, became a nurse. And my younger brother and I were introduced to our first church school, which led me to Avondale subsequently and Rennie, my younger brother, to the Sydney Sand where he was, became a lab technician. Can you see, as I do now, that the ducks were lining up when we knew nothing about it? It began in 1951, it seems. Over to you. So, after college, Leon's first teaching position was in Sydney. And I tried to get a teaching job as well because I was qualified, I thought. However, I found that my qualifications from Avondale didn't actually suit the state that I was in, New South Wales, and they only worked in private schools in Victoria. And we weren't living in Victoria, we went to Sydney. Um, I did register in Victoria, however, and it came in handy. God had his hand in that as well. I worked in Sydney as a secretary and a stenographer. Most people today hardly even know what shorthand is. Put up your hand if you ever heard of shorthand Ooh, or a few people. A... Yeah, as far as I know, it's not even used anymore. However, typing, which I also learned, has morphed into the most important skill you can have. And every kid learns typing in grade one or two now. Um, we all have the same QWERTY t- keyboard, and that was very handy. One day a girl came to work. And she said, my husband and I are going to go to England. And I thought, how romantic. I'd love to be able to do that. And I went home and I said, Leon, can we go to England? He said, why do you think we want to go to that stupid place for? Why do you think we left the place? I'm not going back to that dump. I felt felt very squashed. 
But before we finished the conversation, she said, I would go to Canada. I thought, right, that will do. <laughs> so the next day I booked a fare to Canada for both of us in about a year's time and we started saving money. My Avondale College um, qualifications matched up with what they wanted in British Columbia and off we went and I taught at Cassie Hall Primary School in a place called Terrace which is in northern, northwestern Canada in British Columbia in a town that's not a very big town even today. It was a wonderful experience. I bought a set of the Bible story and I began to read that to the kids in the class. They loved it. We were allowed to read a text from the Bible every morning and have a prayer. That's what was done in public schools in Canada in 1969 and 70. I also had 42, up to 42 children in my class. Put your hand up if you've been in a class with 42 kids. Just haven't quite got enough um, time to check around the 40 kids before somebody starts playing up. It's, it's too many, far too many to have in a room. Um, we then went with an enterprising friend to a very remote town. This town you could only get into by air or by ship. You couldn't walk there, certainly. It was far north. It was on the border of Alaska. I had to order the school, the books, the desks, the duplicator, the sports equipment for the school because our friend wanted only to employ Adventists. And Adventist people that are ready to work usually have children. And they didn't want their kids in the public school, so he wanted to provide an Adventist school for these kids. Well, it wasn't an Adventist school, but it was kind of, because Leon and I were going to be the teachers. The school came on a barge and was still on that barge when it was time for school to start on the 1st of September in 1970. The boss was a cousin of our enterprising friend, and he said, look, this company's going broke. It's no use getting that school off. I said, but I'm being paid every week as a teacher, and I've ordered the school, and the kids have got nowhere to go to school, and they need to go to school. Can we please just get that thing off? Eventually, within one month, by the 1st of October, I had convinced him that they'd better get that school off the barge and get it in place. So they found a place to put it, and kids started to come to school. How many were there, 17, 17. or 18? Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, because they had missed a whole month of school, we had school every day, including Sundays. And on Sabbaths, we used the schoolhouse as a church. Freeze up came, and the kids skated to school down the roads. It was very cold in Canada. And we filled an area with water just before freeze up, the night before freeze up. And we had a skating rink all winter. The kids could bring their skates and skate out there in recess. You know, those kids, they can put up with awfully cold temperatures and they know how to dress up. And we had the church believers there on Sabbath. God took care of us when the axe finally fell and the pay stopped in January 1971. Because the kids were still at school, having nothing else to do, and their mums were at home, we kept on teaching without pay. The dads went off to other towns looking for another job. And whenever they found one, they'd return and take their families away to the new place. But usually they left the contents of their fridge and freezer for us because they knew we had no pay. And we weren't likely to be getting any pay. And we had been teaching their kids. So some sent us some money. And one family even baked two loaves of bread for us every week. School finished at the end of June and we were completely broke. When I mean completely broke, um, we would pray in the morning and sit looking at one another over the table. We didn't know what to do. We had just paid off the last payment on our car and it left the bank just in a little bit of an overdraft. So we owed the bank money. We didn't have any, certainly didn't have any money to go shopping or for any food. And we ended up with what we had been given with about 10 litres of honey in a honey pot and some frozen sliced bread. And believe me, for weeks that's all we had to eat. Bread and honey and no hope of anything else. The remoteness of Stuart meant that the only way out was by Errol Sea. And 
That required a ticket, and we weren't going to be able to get one. So we were in a lot of trouble, but even then the Lord looked after us. Leon had planned to go to Andrews to do his MA, and that was starting in September, and we hadn't even paid anything. We had, we had applied, but we had to pay $1,000 to Andrews to be able to come because we were overseas students. However, God came to our rescue. After another enterprising Canadian man came to town, he gave uh, some work to some of the men who were still left there. And Leon got a job in late July, and that netted him $900. And I managed to get a few days at the hospital as a nurse, but in a small town of less than 1,000 people, the hospital wasn't populated. We had no beds, so I only get three days out of nine there as a nurse's aide. And then, because I was a secretary, I did a couple of days at the bank, and I managed to net $100. And we paid it all to Andrews University in faith. We still kept eating bread and honey, and we had to start there in September. So by now, we were well into August. Then the most amazing thing happened in the mail came an offer to have a credit card. We'd never heard of credit cards. Nobody had ever heard of credit cards. It was the first credit card that had ever been offered. Probably hundreds and thousands of other people were offered them as well. And I looked at it and I thought, credit? That's the last thing we need. We already owe money. I don't want to get any further into debt. So I threw it away, thinking, we don't need that. But they sent a second offer. And the second offer mentioned that you could buy air tickets. You could do anything with this credit card. I thought, air tickets? Wow! Air ticket we will have. So I rang up and booked an air ticket on the credit card with no hope of knowing how we were ever going to pay. However, it got us out of Prince Rupert to Prince Rupert, I should say, out of a little place called Stewart. If you go home, have a look on your internet, look up Stewart, Canada, and you'll see this tiny little town where we lived at the end of a fjord. So God had us in mind. So we've collected our car. We had to pay the, the storage with the credit card. Didn't know how we were going to pay off the credit card. And we filled it up with fuel on the credit card. And we drove it 100 miles down to the next town, to the place called um, Terrace, Terrace, where we had lived before. And in Terrace, there was an office still operating, belonging to our enterprising friend, and his accountant was there. And we called in to say hello, and he said, guess what? The receivers are going to pay all your wages in one hit, and it's waiting in Victoria in, near, in Vancouver, just opposite from Vancouver, it's waiting down there for you. There's six thousand dollars. Now, in 1971, six thousand dollars was a lot of money. It was six months' wages all at once. So God was looking after us after all. So the credit card paid for all the fuel for a thousand miles all the way down to Victoria and on the ferry across to Victoria. And we went up to about the sixth floor in a high building and we were given a check for $6,000. We could hardly believe our luck. So, of course, we went straight down to the bank and we paid off what we were owing the bank. We paid off the credit card. We sailed across the border and headed for Andrews University. We got there about three days before I started. And we were able to pay the fees that we needed to pay. And praise the Lord, his leading rewarded our faith. From Andrews University, which is where we left there, I spent my professional life in teaching, of course, and I have to say I enjoyed every minute of it. At Avondale, I had begun on, a, on the uh, ministerial course and I did two years of that. And for some strange reason, I was impressed that that wasn't for me. And so I changed to teaching midstream, became a teacher rather than a minister. And in looking back now, it was a wonderful move, I have to say. Because I was a round peg in a round hole. Thank you, Jesus. But also during that 30-year period, Three other significant areas 
of my life opened up, which would set me up for what God had in mind for our retirement. One was street preaching in Melbourne. On a Sunday night, we'd set up the generator. Anybody else gone to the big cities and street preached? Yes, yes, yes. It's an exciting business. Set it up in Burke Street in the middle of Melbourne and sing and pray and preach. That experience stirred in me a desire to preach later in retirement to flower in Vanuatu. But that's another 40 years down the track. Secondly, in the 1980s, I discovered worship music. It led to a personal revival, discovering God's closeness, which opened the way to showing God's closeness and love on my preaching platform in Vanuatu. Thirdly, during my teaching years, <clears throat> my natural bent to the practical was developed as a hobby. Welding, fixing cars, spray painting, and our property maintenance began when one day in the 1980s, Shirley realised that we were part of the baby boomers that everybody talked about. <laughs> and one day soon, all the baby boomers were going to retire. And the question arose, would there be any money for a pension super for us? So that's when Shirley began collecting houses. And with that move, my skills at plumbing and electrical work and fixing and carpentry and building set us up for the Elhaven project in Vanuatu in which we are now involved. God saw it coming. The ducks were lined up in a row, but we didn't have a clue. We retired in 2000 and spent the next 10 years building and houses and stuff. In 2010, we really retired, spending a year travelling around Australia and praying uh, that God would find us something useful to do in our real retirement. Uh, ADRA, teaching ESL in some country. I even applied for the directorship uh, of, of a country with ADRA. But God had a clear plan in mind for us, and it wasn't that, and we didn't know. An evangelist by the name of Leo Shreven had just finished baptising about 40 or 50 people in this town here. And a new church arose out of the ashes called Garden City Fellowship. And here you all are. While we were travelling Australia and seeking guidance, God had spoken at that same time, unbeknownst to us, to a lady in Vanuatu called Pastor Dorlan Laloye and placed on her heart the need to build a refuge centre for mothers who would otherwise abandon their unwanted newborns in the bush down a long drop toilet or over the side of a boat. The, while that was going on and she was fretting about what to do, between 2013 and 16, Pastor Ben, who wanted people to head over and from this church, be missionaries, we responded with Katie and Joseph um, and Loini and Ruth uh, on three or four mission trips to Vanuatu. In 2015, just before we left uh, for that mission trip in August, God spoke directly, audibly, male voice, out loud to Katie. 19 words. Katie, the money that you are going to get from your uncle's inheritance is not for you. It's to start an orphanage. And Katie had no clue as to what that meant. We flew to Vanuatu. Those are people who know Katie know what I'm talking about. We flew to Vanuatu. <clears throat> um, with an excited, bewildered, but expectant Katie. An orphanage. And in miraculous circumstances we found ourselves, the seven of us, on a plane that we hadn't booked on, and Katie, in casual conversation with her seatmate, stranger, learned of a Vanuatuan lady who had been impressed by God to build an orphanage. And the two women's dreams came together. In 2017, when we came to purchase the land, we decided then to do the building on behalf of Pastor Dorlan in the centre. Um, we went to the estate agent. There was only one. And we told him what we wanted, or at least Dorlan did, and he said, there's only one piece of land that's 
that uh, fits anywhere near what you're asking. In fact, we've only got one piece of land on the books. Do you want to see it? When we saw it, I remember, do you remember Doran's response? Mm, it's perfect. This is perfect in tears. As it happened, the white man who had owned it had scarpered. He didn't want any more of Vanuatu. He'd gone back to Australia and he'd reduced the sale, the price of that rock of land from 120 to 60,000. Uh, and subsequently, uh, when Shirley offered uh, 40, <laughs> he accepted. <clears throat> Yours. Yeah, yeah, it's a hobby of mine. Yes, it does happen in poor countries where the cost of taking care of a new life is too much to plan for. And uh, so in 2016, I went to Port Vila and I ended up staying at a discount motel. The owner of that motel was very helpful. He got me in touch with right people and also printed documents for me and letters for me. I visited the site we had bought. And I set out, well, some of you that know anything about building, I set out the measurements on the ground, so this is tripping around native plants and things like that for the first building, the storage shed. I had three pieces of iron reinforcing about this long and a stick. Um, it wasn't square, but it, was, it only had four corners. And um, I used my Pythagoras theorem and things that you have to do to, um, to get your measurements right. And I wasn't too far out, actually. Um, I had a measuring tape and a level. I visited the planning authorities. I went to many government offices trying to get government Van Van Vanuatu support but to no avail. Need is the currency of that country, Vanuatu, and people who come to help are considered income for the country. Much of the money that comes from New Zealand and the Australian, Australian government um, ends up in private pockets or in vehicles for government offices, corruption has been effective life there. When Leon arrived from Australia, he suddenly had to go straight to New Zealand, back to here, to attend to some important business we had, and he was gone for another week. First, I met a lady who was, this was the first miracle, she was doing a private study for the Pacific, um, trying to work out whether the Pacific people were uh, being damaged by the amount of um, uh, mercury in the fish they were eating and she was testing people's hair. She gave us money for the project, for the service. I took her to church and she met lots of people there. And so the money she gave us was a little bit of a help to what we were doing. So God put us together. I only met her by mistake and found she was staying at the same motel. We moved into a room under the president's house and we had to go back, I had to go backwards and forwards to the block by bus, which is very inconvenient. I actually lost a good level because I left it on the bus. Um, we asked Fletcher Corporation if they would do the building for us because we knew that they did a lot of work in Vanuatu. Um, Tony did ask the bosses here in Auckland. They said, no, we've put enough money into, va into Vanuatu after Cyclone Pam 2015, and we're not doing any more. A wonderful singing group came to Australia in 2018, and we were able to raise about 100,000 for the building. Leon thought we should take them to the US. That didn't work out quite so well, but it ended up bringing in a little more. At the beginning of 2019, we started the foundations for the top block. The land's on a slope, and they've been excavated into three levels. So the the main building's on the top block. There's a picture of it there. Digging into coral rock is very difficult and you can be a very strong man and you can have a pick or a mattock and you can't get anywhere. And so Fletcher's did loan us their, what they call a rock breaker, an amazing machine that just pounded it. And they didn't charge us anything. They moved um, some containers into place for us with their crane and didn't charge us anything. So we've had lots of volunteers. Um, we had volunteers twice now from Nunawadding Church in Melbourne who've helped us to build a wonderful garden beds and paths and steps to make living there um, a lot easier on the compound. They also put a roof up, which we showed, told you about a couple, about, about a year ago, over an open area, which has been used for a church meeting place ever since. Um, and they brought money to pay for the work that they did. And they're looking forward to coming again later this year um, when That's everything enough, yeah. ends, uh, opens up in July, we believe. I've just got a couple of comments. I'll skip this, this next chunk here. Um, 
Yesterday I talked to Carl. Carl is interested in bringing a team from New Zealand to um, help out there sometime. Just know that that's live and if there are any volunteers here, particularly plumbers, I need a plumber, I haven't got one yet, uh, be for seven days, seven to ten days. So, so bear that in mind. Um, and it'll be in this August. I have a team from Australia coming, lots of jobs to do. Um, so please bear that in mind. Um, I became aware recently um, <clears throat> that one of the best ways to raise funds is to find Christian people who are selling their houses. Quite a number of those Christian people will want to say thank you to God. And because house prices are going that way in general, there's generally quite a lot of money involved. My brother-in-law, Andrew, has been offered a phenomenal amount for his beachside house. He's decided to sell it and, and uh, give what he's giving to God to El Haven. Um, and we did the same thing recently. We swapped a house. Lots of money left over from what we invested. Um, so what I'm asking you to do, and this I'll finish here. If you know someone, a believer, who's selling a house, I'd like you to put them in touch with me. Because it could be that they are one of the ones who would give a thank offering back to God. And it's a lot better raising funds that way than baking cakes. Thank you for your attention.